Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy in the closing moments of this day. Help us to gather up the fragments of this week, of the thoughts and ideas that we've had, those that were in agreement with your will and those that were not. And may we come before you before the sacred hours of the Sabbath to find reconciliation and reunion with you. May the study that we have be the means of facilitating that work so that when we enter into holy time, we might be one with you. Please help us and guide us. We know that we need the Holy Spirit to inspire not only our minds but our hearts to be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I know some of you might be thinking, it's going too fast and there's a lot of information and you just can't keep up. Um, the growth of a Christian doesn't happen in a day or a week. The work of sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And this sanctification process could be described in many ways. And one of them is, as Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And so we know that we need our minds to be renewed, to be reorganized, to be refreshed in this new living way. It takes time for that to happen. And the mechanism for that, I believe, is through a correct understanding of his word. And it doesn't just mean, um, Terry's picked up this, he had this little chart. And it, we have all these nice charts, which are all good. And you know, we have all of these dates on them. And it's not just the memorization of the dates. Because good as though that may all be, sometimes it doesn't really facilitate or help us to understand what's actually going on. So even though we go through a lot of information, and if you feel like it's information overload, I want to encourage you not to become distressed by that, but just to, if I can put it this way, just to sit back and relax and just enjoy the experience. Just like you go to a restaurant and you enjoy the food. You know, a day later, you just remember it was a nice experience, um, but you don't feel how that food has really benefited you one way or the other. You, don't, you can't actually have any oh, self-awareness that your muscles have grown, or you've created new hair from that apple that you ate, but you know it happened. So it's the same with Bible study. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that God wants, to enjoy, wants us to enjoy studying with him, enjoying time with him, even if we don't understand everything. Um, and if you see little moments where you think, oh, that was really tasty, that was enjoyable, enjoy the moment. Even though you may, may not be able to replicate it afterwards or remember all the intricacies, it doesn't mean that the Lord didn't speak to you, it didn't mean that you didn't enjoy yourselves. Um, and I think so often we get concerned and worried that we can't retain all the information, that we're not as clever as the next person, and that there's something wrong with us. And, th and there isn't. I don't think God looks at us that way. So please enjoy yourselves. If it means that you didn't even take any notes and you just enjoy the time together, then I, I think it's been a, a good time together. All the facts and information, you can learn them quite easily once you begin to see a framework of how the scriptures are put together. Um, and there aren't that many rules, really, but it takes practice to 
acclimatise ourselves or become familiar with how those rules are, um, are brought out in the scripture. So all I want to do with our time together, because it's not, even though it seems a lot, it's not that long, for us to really understand all that we need to about end time prophecy. Kind of just dipping our toes in the water. And it's just for us to get a feel of how we would approach the scriptures. Because it's, it's different to the way we normally do it, or the way that we've been taught to do it. And there are many reasons for that, and you know, I'm not here to bash the church or to slate it. But in many ways, the church has taken principles from Babylon and incorporated some of those principles and ideas in the way we actually approach the scriptures. It's not that we teach error per se. You know, the church doesn't teach any error. We all know there's a Sunday law, and you, all of us learnt that from our church. We know that um, we don't enter into spiritualism, which is the state of the dead. We understand all of that, and the church hasn't fallen into those doctrinal problems. But the way we approach scripture has actually caused us many problems, so that we can't understand end-time prophecy correctly, in a way that actually helps us to prepare. And... To re-educate ourselves is a lot of work, because even though you don't realise it, from the very beginning of your Christian Adventist walk, you've been taught principles that aren't particularly wrong, but they're also not very helpful in the way that we deal with things. And it's connected to this idea of work. Remember we said, if it was us who was doing this work, What's our perspective? That we're going out to the world, giving this gospel message. But if it's God, he looks at it differently. He sees the whole world needs sorting out, and part of the world is us. So this perspective, whether you think about God or whether you think about us, is slightly different. And I don't think we really catch this properly um, when end-time prophecy is taught in the scriptures. So don't be concerned if, if it's too much information and you can't see how I jump from four months to Noah's and jump back again. Because we're going to do a lot of jumping back and forth. But I want you to see that it can be done. And if you've seen me do it and you can't replicate it, don't worry. But if you can see that when I did it, it had some semblance of truth to it. Even though you don't have all the ability to actually say, well, what? I have to really think about that. You need to go back and think about it to see if, it, if it's true or not. But if you can see it being done and you see some logic to it, then hopefully you can see, I heard some truth. And someone says, well, what was the truth? You say, I can't quite put my finger on it. <laughs> I don't think that's a problem because it takes time to get used to it. But just as long as you say, yeah, I heard some truth and I can't replicate it, but I'm pretty sure it's okay. Go and watch a video or something like that and you'll see. Remember what uh, the story of Philip and Nathaniel when they had a conversation? What, how did their conversation go? <laughs> Philip said, come let us take your son Messiah. Yeah. So Philip says to Nathaniel, we found the Messiah. Yeah. He says, where did he come from? And Philip says, from Nazareth. <laughs> and Nathaniel says, <laughs> that doesn't... That doesn't, that doesn't sound correct according to, according to the Bible. It's not in agreement with the Bible. Yeah? Do we know that? It's not in agreement with the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach that the Messiah comes from Nazareth. Yeah? It teaches he comes from Bethlehem. So he says, can any good thing, can the Messiah, can God come from Nazareth? And Philip doesn't get into an argument. He says, I don't understand about end time prophecy. <laughs> I don't understand it, but it seems right. Go and find out for yourself. Yeah, he does what he can do. Yeah, but we we need to be we need to be like Philip in that in that context. So this work that we've spoken about lasts for twelve hours, and so I know if you just here, it all looks <laughs> overwhelming. It looks what's he doing? Here? It's all a mess. Uh, but there was a system, there was a method behind this. And the thing I wanted to pick up the most is Revelation and Isaiah. 
And why do you want to pick that up? Because it's a recurring theme over and over again. And in fact, it's the cornerstone or the bedrock of end time prophecy. You need to see how prophecy works. And prophecy is not, I'm standing here and I'm saying the world is going to come to an end. Because people are going to say, what does it look like? What's going to happen? And we're going to say, there's going to be a Sunday law at the end. Okay? So here I am, Sunday law at the end. And this person says, and how do you know that? How do you know there's going to be a Sunday law at the end of the world? And Sister Wendy, what's your answer to that question? How do you know there's going to be a Sunday law? That's because it happened before. But a normal Adventist would say what? Because the, the Bible oh, says so. Because the Bible says so and it doesn't. The Bible doesn't say, no. say there's going to be any Sunday law. No. It says about the mark of the beast and nobody knows what the beast is, let alone its mark, because it's a computer chip of some kind. Mm. Yeah? <laughs> so we don't know what's going on. And you said, how do we answer that question? Mm-hmm. How do we answer that question? We know there's Sunday law. How do you, how do you know there's going to be a Sunday law? Because it happened. Okay, because it's happened before, okay? But most Adventists won't say that. They'll say, you know what? Read this great book. What's the great book you've got to read? Great Controversy. It'll all explain it in there. Yeah, that's what we do. And that works all good and well for the past 150 years or whatever it is until the internet age came up. And then when the internet age came up, you can't give people a great controversy and say, just read the book. It all, it's all there. So what's the first thing they're going to do? Who is Ellen White? Who is Ellen White? Yeah. 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 Who is Ellen White? And you're going to get into a big mess. Mm-hmm. The internet is going to be a big problem. By the way, do you know when the internet was invented? It was for the government of the United States. Oh, it wasn't for the government. It wasn't for the government. What was the question? When was the internet invented? What was it? Oh, it was yeah. DARPA. For the army the oh yeah we, we, not, who was it for when, when? And, and I'm saying it wasn't for the army it wasn't for the military oh. they think it was but it wasn't who was it who was the internet invented for probably to control the masses it was no. it was invented for <laughs> us for I us. believe I oh. think it was I think it was oh. for God's people oh, okay. so that we could disseminate the truth in a really effective way but there's a struggle over the internet mm-hmm. uh, and I'll tell you what the year it's 1989 Oh. Is that Apple? Uh, no, it was a government agency that did it, or some you know people in Silicon Valley. I don't know. I don't know. Some university somewhere in America. Um, but it was in 1989 that it it came on into the public conscience, and that was that's the year that we mark it's been invented, 1989. And it's really important to know because we're going to see a lot of things happen in 1989. Oh, yeah. Soviet Union fell. Soviet Union fell. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. say. So we could call this the time of the end. You all familiar with this? Yeah. And what happens at the time of the end? It should be an in- yeah. an increase, oh. an increase of knowledge. Yeah. And it's all biblical knowledge. Mm-hmm. But the, you know, the, the, the technology that's turned the world upside down is the internet. And it's not a coincidence that it happened at the time of the end. Mm-hmm in preparation for the work that we have to do. If without the internet, we'd just be isolated entities all the, across the world, not being able to communicate together. Uh, you know, we've all got phones. Phones wouldn't work without the internet. Smartphones wouldn't. We wouldn't be able to communicate in the way that we, that we do we're so readily nowadays. All the information that we have, the video presentations. Um, without the internet, nothing. we would not be able to give this message. You wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. No, I wouldn't be here without the internet. Smoke signals. It would be smoke signals. <laughs> and they're, they're good, but they're not. They're not that good. <laughs> so, we've spoken about this work, and we've spoken about Revelation and Isaiah. In Revelation, it talks about the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And this concept needs to be understood really clearly. So I want us to really think about it this week, the Alpha and Omega. We're going to go over it over and over again in many different ways. So when we read the verse, uh, Alpha and Omega, we saw speak about the beginning and the end. That's what it means. And then we went to Isaiah 46.10 because it speaks about the end and the beginning. 
of the Alpha and the Omega. And we saw that this verse, just this one simple verse, a simple reading of the verse, so much information is obscured that you really start thinking about the verse. And I was speaking to uh, my sister during the break, and one thing that I want us to begin to become familiar with is that when we read scripture, is that I want us to try and understand what the words are saying, which often means we have to understand the grammar, we have to fight through the King James, and sometimes it's the language is a bit difficult. And the, and the, and the, the problem with that is that if we switch over to uh, one of the revised versions, sometimes the language, even though it's much easier to understand the thought that is being portrayed, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that language uh, is, a, is not as tight, is not as precise and accurate as the King James. And it's a little bit loose. So we, we can't really look at the words or the sentence structure in an analytical way as we can with the King James uh, for most of the revised versions. So that's why we tend to stick with the King James version um, because it's a lot more technically accurate. Um, and not only that, when the right for the most of her ministry and particularly the Millerites, um, when they use the Bible, they're going to use the King James Bible and a lot of their phraseology or the way they express their thoughts and ideas are all taken from, King, from the King James. And so if we switch over to a new version, it's sometimes hard to cross-reference their work to the revised versions. Um, and a lot of their quotes, it says RSV. Did the estate put that in there? No, she put it there in her, in her own time, yeah. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not trying to put any negativity about revised versions. They have a place. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're good for cross-referencing things. Sometimes they help us to see things in a clearer way. So I'm not, I'm not disparaging uh, the revised versions. I, I know all of the arguments. Not, I don't know all of them, but I know many of the arguments about why the King James is better than the others. Um, the people consider them to be apostate Catholic Bibles and all of that. Um, I've heard all of those arguments before, and that, that's not the point I'm making. All I'm saying is that when we read the King James, some of that language is not straightforward. And on top of that, we're, the, we're just not used to reading analytically or critically, especially when it comes to scripture. You just pick a few words up, a sentiment, and then we move on. So we went to Isaiah 46, verse 10, and we can see three rules in that verse. Repeat at large, the Bible interprets, it, interprets itself, and this reflection of chiastic structure. One thing that I want to un want us to notice that rule number two, the Bible interprets itself. Often, what we do is we we start with one verse, and the first thing we do is jump to another verse mm -hmm. to get this other verse to understand or explain what this verse means. We go from verse to verse. Yeah. But I'm saying our first port of call before we go to another verse should be to understand what this verse means instead of jumping forward. Because how do we jump from one verse to another? How do we actually make the connections? Similar words. Similar words. So we're going to take a singular word from one verse, and then we're going to cross-reference it, often with a computer or a, a book, um, with, an, with the same word in another verse. And you know that's all good and well, and it helps us a lot. But you still need to know what the, verse, what the word means in, that, in the context of the verse. So, I don't know if we, I know we don't have charts here, does everybody know what the daily is? Have you, have you heard about the daily? Uh, it's found in the book of Daniel, it's found in, in, in many different places. Um, so, I'm not, I'm not saying that we want to read this thing, but I only want to bring up this point. So, the word daily is found in the book of Daniel, and it's found five times in the book of Daniel. Um, I think it's found 104 times in the whole of the scriptures and five times in the book of Daniel. So what we could do is, in the book of Daniel, we could read the five verses that it speaks about the daily. And it's found in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11, and Daniel chapter 12. It's 8, 11, 8, 12, and 8, 13, I believe. And 11, 31... And 12, 11. So I think it's 8, 11, 8, 12, 
and 8.13, and then 11.31, and then 12.11. Now, if we were to do what Sister Wendy just told us to do, is you take the word daily, and you cross-reference it to all of those places in the book of Daniel, you're going to have a pretty comprehensive understanding of what the daily is, because it's found in, the, in all of those verses. Now, the problem is, if we were to do that, we're assuming, what are we assuming? That the word daily in one verse is the same daily in another verse. So what we're saying is the word daily means the same thing through five different verses. Does that make sense in that, with that logic? Yeah? Does that make sense? Now the problem is, if you go through the verses carefully, you're going to find that the way the word daily is used in each of those verses is not the same. It has slight differences to it. And if you just took the word daily in one verse, and you said, oh, I know what the daily is in this verse here. Say it was Daniel 12, 11. I know what the word daily is. Therefore, whatever it means in that verse, it must mean the same thing in chapter 8 or chapter 11. And if you carefully read the verses you'll find that it doesn't actually mean exactly the same thing it's, it has these subtle differences between them and so that's the problem when you use this rule which is a proper rule to use that the Bible interprets itself and you jump from verse to verse in different pl places in the scriptures we are supposed to do that but if you do that prematurely you can find that first of all the Bible won't explain itself in the way that you need it to and also, that you may come to a wrong conclusion. So you remember in the last study, we said the beginning and the end. At the end of the world, here, as it was in the days of Noah, Matthew 24, 37 to 38, so shall it be at the end of the world. So we've got Noah and the end of the world, eating, drinking, marrying, eating, drinking, marrying, but they were destroyed by a flood. Mm -hmm. But remember our sister said, there's no flood at the end of the world. In fact, the scriptures are clear, it says, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood at the beginning, and what's it going to be destroyed with at the end? Fire. With fire. Mm -hmm. So you have a problem if you're saying it's going to be a flood at the end of the world. Yeah? If you just use the words in there, just one, two, three, four, five letters, and say a flood is a flood, then we know what a flood is, that a flood is just water, you have problems. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand what the flood means in its context, in a particular history even, because it means something slightly different throughout uh, all of these varying histories. Mm -hmm. So that's all I'm saying is, when we, do, when we use this rule, the Bible interprets itself, the best place to go to is where? The same verse. As much as we can. Sometimes we can't. And once you've gone to the verse and you've understood the verse clearly, if it doesn't interpret itself, then you need to go somewhere else to help you understand what that verse means. Yeah? But it, we should focus primarily on the verse itself. And I want us to try and become familiar with doing that. So often, if we've got a verse, I'll just randomly say, okay, John 4.35, what does that verse mean? And we could just read it and... What you'll find will tend to do, and it happens all the time, I'll say, can you explain, my sister, can you explain this verse? And you'll begin to explain it, and you'll start reading half the verse to me. And I'm going to stop you, and I'm going to say, no, that, that, I can read the verse. Don't read the verse, I want you to tell me what the verse means in your own words, in your own understanding. And people begin to struggle really quickly when they do that, because it's something that we're not used to doing. We're not used to using our analytical skills that we all learnt at school, or if you've been to college, we're not used to using that in Bible study. And we might say, well, you know, that's for theologians. And where have the theologians of Adventism taken us? Mm. <laughs> you know, into, into apostasy. And so we, we, we have it as a badge of honour by saying we're not theologians. We're just simple people. You know, we read the Bible as it's written. So we have this false humility, if I can call it that, that we're ignorant, and ignorance is bliss, apparently. 
<laughs> Not like those theologians who spend all of this thousand dollars doing their degree and they don't know the left hand from their right hand. So perhaps there's a happy middle ground where we're not these theologians that have been educated incorrectly and we're not ignorant of the scriptures, but we want to use common sense and we want to use reason and logic and the power of thought to really understand what's going on. And people are not familiar with that, so sometimes people find it a bit threatening. I look at you and I ask you a question. If you don't give me the answer, I'm going to say, have another go. Pick on someone else. Pick on someone else. Don't pick on me. Stop picking on me. So please don't think that I'm picking on you. Um, think of it as a privilege. A privilege that you're getting the opportunity to be put in a hard place. So we went through this idea and we saw that verse 46, sorry, chapter 46, verse 10, is quite complicated. I know this all looks complicated. A, B, B, A, all this mathematical lingo or does it make sense but hopefully you can when you read the verse it makes sense that that's how the verse is structured and I want us to see how we structure verses because if you don't do that what you're going to find have you all heard of this story where this um it's not it's not a story it's like a parable that there's this beggar who wants to be fed and every time you pass him by you give him a fish and he gets fed for a day He's always hungry. Yeah? And instead of giving him a fish, what should you, what should you give him? Teach him yeah, you give him a fishing rod and teach him how to fish so he doesn't need you. Yeah? And a lot of teacher, pupil, or student relationships are based upon this idea that you need me. Mm. You, know, you, you need me. And it keeps me employed. <laughs> uh, and I love this position that I get, that I get this uh, idea of being self-glorified or self-glorification, and that uh, you look at me as someone special and say, oh, I don't know what this verse means, call Paminda, he'll know, he'll know it for us. <laughs> yeah, and I feel good and keep you in your place. <laughs> and, and, and Adventism is structured a lot like that. Exactly. And, it, and it, Catholicism is structured, so you know where we get these thoughts and ideas from. And we, and we need to break this cycle, yeah. you know, because we're all brethren. Mm -hmm. um, and often we don't want to hand all the information over, because if I told you everything I knew, I wouldn't have a job, would I? <laughs> You're going to invite me back again. I can't, tell you, I can't tell you everything. I have to hold something <laughs> back. And that's how, and that's how we, we, we behave in so many subtle ways. Mm -hmm. And we don't really fully give of ourselves. So I really want us to be comfortable that even though all of this looks complicated, that we can begin to see, yeah, I, maybe I could have a go at that. Maybe I could look at some structures. Yeah? Okay. So I want to come back to this, because you've all agreed, and I'm going to stop here for a moment. And we're going to do Isaiah 46, verse 10 again. Okay? So do you remember how we did that? Okay, because I know my sister wasn't here, so I'm going to refresh our minds. Let's go to Isaiah 46, verse 10. And I know we didn't, we didn't do the whole verse. We could split the verse into three sections, part A, part B, and part C. And we only looked at part A and part B. It says here, part, um, I called it E. I should really, let me call it B, because E just doesn't make any sense. And we have C here. We didn't look at C. We could have done and we should have done, but for the purposes of our study, we just looked at the first part. So it's a really simple verse. It says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel, sh my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. So, I don't know if you notice, there's another repeat and enlarge here, which we didn't do. It says, my counsel shall stand, and I will do my pleasure. Now, if we, if, we, if we really focus on that and spend some time understanding what those two phrases mean, you're going to see it's a repeat and enlarge. So when God says, my counsel shall stand, what does that mean if I said my counsel is going to stand? If I told you my counsel is going to stand. 
Well, let's do the first bit first. Okay. If I said my counsel shall stand, what does it mean? Shall stand. Yeah. Let's speak the truth. Okay. Speak the truth. Everlasting. What he says, he means. He says, my counsel shall stand. When I say something, it's as firm as a rock. It's going to stand. It's not going to be moved. So he says, my counsel shall stand. What I say. I mean. That's good. And then it says, and I will do all my pleasure. So, what is God's pleasure? It's his... It's his, in the words, in the verse? It's his counsel. His pleasure is his counsel. And it's going to stand firm because he's going to do it. Yes? So, if we think about the first part of the verse, it says, declare the end from the beginning. What's he going to do? He's here. And what's he going to do? He's going to do something at the. He's going to do something at the end. And what he's going to do at the end? This council. Is it firm or not? Yeah. It's firm. He means what he says. And he's already told us what's going to happen at the end. How did he tell us what's going to happen at the end? By. What happened. In the beginning. In the beginning. And is it firm? Yes. Is it going to change? This is why we can have so much confidence that there's about to be a Sunday law. That America is about to get into a lot of trouble. That Catholicism, the papacy, papal Rome, is going to rise to ascendancy. And something we haven't spoken about that I'll just throw in here. That the work of radical Islam that's already going on is about to get a lot worse, mm. not better. Despite everything that you read in the newspapers, despite everything that all the politicians are saying that we're going to get things back on an even keel. Do you use that phrase here? Mm -hmm. Get yeah. it steady. Yeah, it's all going to go. Don't worry. We're, 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 it's under control. You know that it's not going to be under control. And how do you know? Because his counsel shall stand. And he will do his pleasure. And if you want to know what's going to happen at the end, you just need to see what happened at the beginning. beginning. Now, the beginning has many beginnings. Mm -hmm. And the end has many ends. And the beginning and the end, in one story, can end up being the beginning of another story. Yeah? yeah. So, this is why this message begins to become complicated. When I say this message, I mean end time prophecy. Because it's like a wheel within a wheel, mm -hmm. or things that overlap. Mm -hmm. So at the simple level, it's as simple as this. But it begins to quickly become complicated when you get more and more stories coming in. Mm -hmm. So remember we said, how do we know there's going to be a Sunday law? Mm -hmm. Because it was a Sunday law before. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yeah. Who made that Sunday law in 538? Constantine. Constantine. No, it wasn't Constantine. <laughs> Wh which power? Not the king's name. I'm not, not, it's just simple. Who, who made the law in the 538? Uh, the it wasn't Pagan Council Rome. Of not, not even where it was. Greece. Where? Greece. No. 538. It was the papacy. Papal Rome. It's just as simple as that. Papal Rome made that Sunday law. So what do you know is going to happen at the end of the world? It's going to make a Sunday law. But the Bible says, upon the testimony of two or three, something is established, truth is established. So you don't know there's going to be a Sunday law at the end of the world if there's only one Sunday law in past history. So you have to find another Sunday law. And there was a Sunday law before the papal Sunday law in 538. And that was by Constantine that was it by Constantine in the year three two one. So you can remember that easily, just three two one. Yeah? Three twenty one. You can read it through three two one. So Constantine makes a Sunday law in three two one. And Constantine, what power was he? What empire was he? He wasn't papal Rome. Pagan He was pagan Rome. So you have pagan Rome and papal Rome.
pagan Rome and papal Rome. So those two Sunday laws, those two Sunday laws, oh good, if we're okay we'll just study for a little bit longer. Yeah, it's a bit. Um, I don't like preaching, <laughs> but for a long time, uh, when I never used to teach in this capacity, I was at home and we had Friday night vespers, and we'd guard the edges of the Sabbath really carefully. And the you know, Sabbath came in at five o'clock. At four twenty, we'd all be ready, washed and clean. And we'd sing hymns and pray so that we'd guard the edges of that Sabbath. And for a long time after I began to teach, and I get a number of invitations, and often they're weekend presentations, which means that um, I'm presenting on Friday evening and into Sabbath and sometimes Sunday morning. And what often happens is, like this evening, um, the scheduling of the presentations or the studies ends up between before Sabbath and ends after Sabbath begins. And for a long time I, I would do the same. I would open Sabbath at the beginning, or in fact open Sabbath at the end of the meeting after Sabbath has happened. And uh, we were doing some studies recently on sunset. It's become a, a subject of prophecy now. Um, subject of, of, of what the sunset means and the implications of that. Uh, in end time prophecy and it reminded us when we began to look at this subject about guarding the edges of the Sabbath and how we should guard the Sabbath and how we even mark Sabbath yeah. um, and what sunset actually means just a technical definition of where, you know, what sunset means and we spoke about guarding the edges and where would you begin, begin to guard the edges and what is the edge that you're guarding um, it's funny you ask this because I've been thinking about this for several years, so I'll just bring it up. But, um, like, I always, you know, one thing that I remember distinctly was driving. Um, um, I was actually a passenger, but the, the sun was setting, and like, I was looking, I'm like, oh, cool, the Sabbath is about to start. Like, is it when the, like, the sun, the, the bottom of the sun touches the, like, there's a, okay, I'm going to, forgive me for not speaking clearly, but, like, there's, um, the verse that says, like, when the sun hits the earth, like, yeah, basically when the sun touches the horizon, um, that's my thoughts, and when you be begin to guard the Sabbath, or even before that. So we, 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 had, we had all of these discussions and what the first, thing, first place we, we went to was if this was the Sabbath, it has some edges. Yeah, nice. It has some edges to it. <laughs> and as you're approaching the Sabbath this way, this edge needs to be guarded. So where would you, if you put G for guard, where would the guarding be? On the left side. So you'd guard it here. And then as you walk through the Sabbath, and you get to this edge, which needs to be guarded, mm -hmm. where would you guard that edge? On the right side. So here? No. No. <laughs> I would think it would be on the left side because it's starting a new day. Oh, but you said on the right side. Oh, uh, right. You'd have both. On the right both side. sides. Both sides? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I about Christianity? It's quite complicated, isn't both it? Both sides. Both but sides. Wait, because if you're guarding, you're guarding from an intrusion, right? We came to the conclusion that the guardian would be here. Yeah. Yeah. That's where Perry placed it. And the only reason I mention all of that is after these these studies, we, we, we became firm in our thinking that even when we're doing a presentation, we should really guard this edge here. And, and to pretend the Sabbath came in 45 minutes later, or 45 minutes before, wasn't it a technical guarding? What we could call of the way mark. So again, in end time prophecy, we think about the way marks being 
you know, we need to be really accurate and technical about what way marks mean and when they happen when they don't happen. You know, it didn't happen in 1988 or 1990. It was 1989 for a reason. And it's, I know there's many things happen over the year, but at, at a scale that's small enough, it's a singular event, a way mark. And that way mark or that edge needs to be guarded carefully in case someone would attack it and say, actually, though it was 1990, people, some great thing happened in 1990. But we mark it as 1989 for a reason, and we need to guard that edge, because we're watchmen, aren't we? You know, we're watchmen on the walls of Zion, and we must give the trumpet a certain sound. We must be careful that someone should change these things. So that was my little sermon on why we stopped, because we're, I'm trying to be studious now about guarding the edges, Amen. especially when I've... I've been around people, um, you know, I've been a guest, and I'm thinking, should I say something? I'm just a guest or a visitor, I li you know, or friends, or I leave it to other people often. They're not here, but I'm saying generally. Um, and I think, well, I'll do my little prayer. I go to, the, I may not even go to the restroom. You know, my little prayer, I say, let them carry on. And if they want to not, you know, mark the edge of the Sabbath, and because we're all adventists, we all know when it is, but at least I'll be okay. And I've come to realise I don't think that's the best way of approaching it. But I've done that because I don't want to be, um, what do they call it, you know, the person who makes all the trouble and everything like that. Contentious. Sorry? Obtrusive. Obtrusive. Contentious. Yes. <laughs> so I kind of don't promote myself. Mm. That. I just sort myself out. Well, thank you um, for doing that. So I didn't this time. <laughs> <laughs> I interfered in your business. Mm. Okay, so we're here. And we've looked at the verse, and we found two repeat enlarged enlargements now. But our focus is on the beginning of the verse, A and B. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. So we've got end, beginning, comma, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet. So we've got end, beginning, ancient times, not yet. And we've identified that this is a repeat and enlarge. And we're going to see that the Bible interprets itself, and it's going to be done through this chiasm or mirroring. And we saw the mirroring here. It's standard kindergarten, kindergarten mathematics. Get a piece of paper, fold it in half, open it, put two paint splodges on, close it, and you'll see this mirroring effect. So you can see A and B. So you can see the exactly the same thing here. The A's match up and the B's match up. And you know... Not yet means in the future, and the end is in the future. So you can see they're matching, but it's this ancient time that's going to really help us, because it's saying the beginning is the ancient times. So it's a really nice principle to see that. Now, if we've got that all wrong, would it have made much of a difference? No. We still know that God's here at the beginning, he's going to be teaching something at the end. And that would have been a basic understanding of that verse, but the verse teaches a lot more. Mm -hmm. But if we can be familiar with this, it can help us to understand things. So I've got the impression from, from what I'm beginning to gather that um, if not all of you, many of you have gone through this booklet. Yeah, you've read it. So mm -hmm. We all understand, understand about Daniel 11 verses 40 to 45 at some level. Yes? Now, if you go to the church, go to church, for some reason, don't like this message, they're going to go in the, go to these verses and they're going to try and make them say something that they don't say. So it's all about the verses, how these verses are structured, what the language is, the, how, how precisely they've been put together. Now often, us on the message, don't do that. We don't go to the verses and carefully think about what all the words mean and what they say. Um, we do a, a quick word study, and we, we say, uh, it goes with ships and chariots and horsemen. We say, and ships mean? Economy. Economy. Yeah, without really thinking about it in the verse itself, or the verses that surround it in its local context, we just jump. So, let's go to Daniel 11, verse 40.
So we, you've all assented that you've read the verse before and we know what it means, yeah? And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So there's a lot in that verse. And has everybody read the book Daniel, sorry, yeah, Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith? Heard of the book. So when he approaches these verses, he's going to start to change some of the meanings of these verses. And the reason he's going to do that is when he goes into verse 40, it's complex because it has a number of pronouns in there. Everyone really know what a pronoun is? What's a pronoun? Catherine? What's a pronoun? Not in, I'm uh, not in the verse, but just in grammar. What is a pronoun? Okay, what's a noun? Okay, it names a person, a place, or a thing. And so, what is a pronoun? Before it. No. Specific. Just, just, uh, just generally. Doesn't have to be specific. Generally. I'm not trying to. Be a person, place, or thing, but not a proper, not with a proper name? Yes. It's a substitute word mm -hmm. for the proper name. We don't say John ran and John likes food. We say John ran and he. he. So we, use the, we don't use the word John all the way through the sentence. Mm -hmm. We change it for a pronoun, the substitute word for the original noun. Thank you for bringing this up, because I've really struggled in Daniel 11 trying to keep up with all the pronouns, figuring out who it applies to. Yes, and it's not that straightforward. So, when Uriah Smith comes to this passage, uh, he has a number of problems. Um, and he's going to get this, uh, this verse, and he's going to structure it in a way that I don't believe is correct. And his license for doing that is all of these pronouns everywhere in this mm -hmm. passage. So... We're going to use these rules here, and we're going to structure verse 40. So, so I've given you the leading on how, how we're going to do this verse. So let's walk through it together. Because 46 verse 10, although it's an important verse, isn't a make or break verse for end time prophecy, but verse 40 is. Verse 40 is a make or break verse. Um, verse, so we want to make sure that we understand it really clearly about what's happening and how we approach this verse. So before we do that, I've just read the verse to you. Who wants to, and you've all read the book, this book, Time of the End magazine. So how do we, how do you, you know, speak to a brother or sister and say, you know, I want to tell you about end time prophecy, and you hand them this book and everything, what's it talking about? And you're going to go through these verses, and you're going to begin in verse 40. And you're going to read this verse. How would you approach it? What would you tell them this verse is showing? Break it apart into different parts first. Okay, my sister. Thank you. <laughs> tell me how you're going to approach this verse. Tell me, I, I don't know anything about this verse, and you're telling me about end time prophecy, and you're worrying me now. Okay, so so you, you run through the verse and tell me dates, names, places, whatever you want to do to get me enthused, excited, to get me interested to study prophecy. So now we need role play. Uh, You're good at this. Uh, well, talking? Yeah. Um, how, do, uh, how would I approach this verse and get someone interested? Okay. Um, I'd start with the first first line. You go ahead. First verse. Um, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. So we got to find out who exactly is the king of the south, right? Okay. And then we have to find out who's him. Okay, so, so, you, so you, you, we could do a study on that, and you tell me the answers. Okay. Did I get myself? You don't have to prove it to me. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just asking you to tell me who that was. Okay. Um. And we have to establish when the time of the end is. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so you need. First. That would be okay. the first step. First. So you tell me the answer to the, all the nouns. No. No? <laughs> no, I don't, but I'm just taking. Why? No, I, I don't know. I, okay. I don't know. Like better? Like better? Like better? Like better? Well, I know you got it right. In that first sentence, we have to prove king. We've got kingdom. Okay. Okay, so you've got two kings. Yeah. King, yeah, kingdom. Um, I also have to prove which kingdom. Let's go on that attack. In other words, which country, what country is going to be against each other? When's the time of the end? You're going to need to have to prove it to me. Just tell me when it is. 1989. I'm talking about verse 40. And at the time of the end, <laughs> the, ki the king of the south shall push at him. The, end is now. the time of the end is now. So now? Oh. Who's the king of the south? Russia? Russia? Yeah. Um, communism, the atheistic country. Well, can I just read? It's not even, probably not right, but that first section. And in 1798 shall branch okay, um, so you're saying attack. Okay, so you're saying this is 1798? Just what I'm saying. Okay. Sorry? Not 1989. Not 1989. No. So we've got a disagreement on the front <laughs> pew. Uh, if I'm wrong, no. then please. I agree. I agree with that. Okay. So 1798, France mm -hmm. is going to do what? Push at or attack <coughs> war against the papacy. So you're saying this is Roman. the papacy? Yeah. Do you agree with that? Was, because the last yeah. verse talks about... Which last verse? A couple of verses from 37 to 39. <laughs> I fail. <laughs> no, I'm talking to him. Uh, 37 to 39 talks about, uh, describes uh, the king of the north. Well, 36 to 39. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. And then it goes on. Mm -hmm. So this kind of describes maybe um, somebody that's the Antichrist. Say that again? It describes the Antichrist, the, the, um, the king of the north. Okay. All the, which verse did you begin to read from? Uh, 36. Okay. So from 36 to 39 you're saying this is the, the papacy? The papacy. Okay. So you know you disagree with Uriah Smith? Sure. I disagree with him. Does everybody know that? Mm -hmm. So Uriah Smith says something different to this. Mm. Really? Wow. I thought you said you knew that. I didn't, I haven't read it. But oh, I okay. If, if that's what he, if he did something different. Okay. It says, um, the king here introduced, verse 36, cannot denote the same power that was last noticed, namely the papal power. So the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. Mm. 
France fulfills this prophecy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is way back in 36, and the king. Yeah. And if you, if you listen to what he says, it says, uh, the reason is, it says the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. What does it mean, the specifications? All the characteristics of the Bible. Each of those words, he's going to look at all of that and he says it doesn't hold to one power. So you see how important it is to be able to read the verses really carefully and, and glance it over them and, and begin to see what these verses are teaching. You'll be surprised once you get into this subject how many, pe how many Adventists hold true to whatever Uriah Smith says in this book. And if he says it, it must be true. Because he just got, he had a big rubber stamp from who? Ellen B. White. From Ellen White. Ellen White rubber stamped that book. And she said this book was like God's helping hand. Every home should have this book. And people say with such a strong endorsement, it must be correct. There cannot be any errors in it. So I want us to, 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 to know that. And so by the time you get to verse 40, you can begin to see that there's a problem now about who these pronouns are referring to okay. because you've got three parties introduced according to Uriah Smith you've got a king of the south you've got a him and you've got a king of the north you've got three powers so it takes some effort to go into this verse now and show that it's not three powers it's two powers well I think that there's two powers and how are you going to prove that? Uh, well, I, it's happened once before and it's going to happen again. Okay. The Bible are repeated in large. <laughs> okay. So the if you're going to use those principles, then you've got to prove that, that you can use that in this verse. Uh -huh. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have these three powers and Uriah Smith will go through the history very carefully yeah. and he'll explain because who's the king of the north? According to Uriah Smith. According to you, who's the king of the north? Papacy. So I would put king of the north here. But according to Uriah Smith, it's who? Turkey. It's Turkey. So you've got France, Egypt, and Turkey. And if you go back into the history in 1798, in that year, there was a struggle between France. Egypt and Turkey, and he knows that, and he's going to he's going to use that history to defend his position. Mm -hmm. And you're hard pushed yeah. to argue against him when you've got all that weight of evidence. Mm -hmm. So, okay. if I'm you're going to approach these verses, we need to make sure how we're approaching them really carefully. Yes. Amen. Okay, so let's try and do that then. So. It doesn't say King of the North, it says, Time of the end, 1798, King of the South is France, him is the papacy, then what? Um, and then, it papacy will, oh, then I was going to say the next part of the verse. Okay, then it says the King of the North, the king of the north will do what? Come against him. Come against him. Yeah. Okay, so let's stop there. <laughs> so let's stop there. Now we'll, let's proof text. The Bible interprets itself. We're going to take the word him, run it through the and with, If you put the word him, where's the first place you're going to go to? The, the same verse. verse. <laughs> so him. Would be papacy. Him. Well, let's do him equals him. <laughs> isn't it? Mm -hmm. Agree with that? Yeah. You take one verse, it says the Sabbath. You take another verse, it says the Sabbath. What do you know that both verses are talking about? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. Sabbath is the Sabbath. So a hymn is the hymn. Mm -hmm. So you've just told me that the hymn is the papacy. Yeah, so that must mean the hymn is the papacy. But not according to the rules that we just learned. <laughs> so I wanted to see the problem in defending what this book teaches, yeah? Yeah, yeah? Because it's structured in a way that is charming. 
and it draws you in without you maybe understanding some of the technical rules right. of how these verses are put together. So you can come to the right answer, but you start um, studying or dialoguing with a theologian or a historian or someone who loves Uriah Smith <laughs> and you're going you're gonna to run into a brick wall really quickly because how are you going to defend what you're teaching using the rules that you teach? Simple. It's simple. Okay. So, so when you get some of these rules, it, it is simple. We're going to see that it is relatively simple. But I'm saying without these rules, because if you people look into this, I'm just saying, if you just had this, you'd be stuck if someone was to really be technically accurate, even without Uriah Smith, if you were to go through this properly and someone was teaching, they were sitting in a congregation, the first thing they want to know is, why are these hymns two different people, first of all? Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your logic to do that? Because you're going to make a leap of faith in a minute, and you're going to tell me, the King of the North is who? Okay, so this is the papacy. You're going to piece of paper, fold it in half. Okay, so we can't do that yet. You're going to say, this is the papacy, and who's the him? Yeah, okay, this is the king of the south. Wh who's that? Which king of the south? France. You're going to say, this is France. Are you sure? You're not going to say it's France. You're not going to teach it's France, according to the book. So you, Egypt, you're not going to teach it's Egypt. No. Who are we going to teach it is? Russia. We're going to yeah. teach it's Russia. Russia. Oh, yeah. We're going to say this is Russia. And we're going to say, by the way, this is papacy one. And this is papacy two. Not even the same papacy. Right, it's before and after. Okay. And then we're going to say what? Light. We've got how many times at the end? Mm -hmm. When did this happen? Mm -hmm. Papacy 2 attacks Russia. When did that happen? Uh, Sorry? 1989. So, where are you going to put 1989 in here? <laughs> so, yeah, you're going to kind of like put 1989 or something like that. <laughs> yeah? So, Sorry? it's not, no, all I, want us to, all I want us to see is even if we couldn't work out all the answers, it's to be humble enough to recognize that it's not that straightforward and also have the humility to not just the humility but also to have the love to recognize that when we speak to people and they resist what we teach to not pronounce a curse upon them and prescribe them mm. because in this group who believes this I'm just showing you that it's not that straightforward to work it out. And you know, I'm not here to try and shake your faith that this is wrong. It's true. It can, be, it can be defended in many different ways. But it's just for us to have empathy and sympathy with people who struggle with this, who haven't been drawn in the way that we have. And we have to explain these things to them. So that I think some of the smiles that you're seeing, you're thinking, actually, this doesn't even seem reasonable. If a reasonable person who believes the truth, it sounds a bit... Do you use the word dodgy here? Yeah. A bit shaky? <laughs> yeah, it's not. Because him and him should be the same thing, and that's not working. Mm -hmm. Then we switch from France to Russia, and then we've got <laughs> two time at the end. I mean, it sounds... This doesn't even sound like Bible study. <laughs> it sounds craziness. Yeah? And this verse is... Uh, you know, the, the, the central column or the hinge pin to this whole message, if you took this pin out, this whole message collapses. Mm -hmm. And you can see, like, you're thinking, actually, this doesn't work. This, no, not, maybe it's not as strong as we thought. Let's move on to verse 41. That's a lot stronger. <laughs> <laughs> if, you do, if you use that one, it, okay? Because this is the beginning. This is right here at the beginning. Okay, so let's start applying some of these rules now. Okay, and we're going to see the rules are going to guide us. So again, there's a lot in the verse, but we're going to just pick it simply. We're going to pick 
it's in three parts at least. We're going to do the same, we're going to look at part A and part B. Okay, so we've got part A and part B. Mr. Cash, are you going to do this with me? It's just all, it's exactly the same as this, so it's not, I want to suggest it's not difficult. Okay, so we've got A and B. And so what did we have underneath that? We had A, just copy, sorry, B. equals B. A equals B. And in this part A, we had an A and a B. And then I changed it to a dotted line because we're going to reflect it. And then we've got a B and an A. Okay, so now let's fill this in. In this verse it was end beginning, ancient times not yet. So let's go to this verse now. What's the A here? Uh, look, there's a bit, I should actually say there's a bit at the front. So this should really be B and C. So there's a bit at the front here and there's a bit at the back here. So we've got um, time of the end and then we've got uh, horses, chariots and ships. King of the South shall push so we've got him. King of the South King of is going to push against him. And the Did it say that? Him. 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 <laughs> and then what? Then what happens after that? There's a break. Can we see a colon there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A colon is a hard break, and a semicolon is a soft break. There's a hard break there, so the, it breaks the verse for you. Then what does it say? And the king of the north shall come. Okay, so B is? King of the north. King of the north shall come against and like a whirlwind. him. So and we'll stop there, and the whirlwind is all of this bit over there. Yeah. Okay, so can we see the structure here? Yeah? When you know the rules, it's easy to see. And then it becomes defendable. Instead of Uriah Smith having the him being who? He has the him being France. He has the him being France. The king of the south is Egypt. And the king of the north is Turkey. And he has reasons to, to, to explain all of that. He has, he has some logic to it. Yeah, because Turkey is what geographically is to the east north of the glory oh, north of the glorious land. The glorious land is Israel, Israel. and Egypt is king of the south, south, south of, of the glorious, land. glorious land, Israel. So he has a logic to all of this, but he starts on the wrong premise. Starts on the, you start on the wrong premise, the logic would all fit in and make your structure look good and viable. So, who's the king of the south? It's the him, and this him is the king of the north. So how many people have you got? You've got the king of the south comes against the king of the north, and I'm going to say then. The king of the north is going to come against the king of the south. That fits in with all of Daniel 11 so far. It fits in with all of Daniel 11, but we, if, we, if we always try to look at the verse and understand what the verse teaches, our own personal faith will be stronger that we don't have to rely upon other people's interpretation of all those other verses because there's a lot of information and it's complicated. And we're much able, we're much better placed to defend this message. Mm -hmm. Not in a way to attack people, but to bring them in. Mm -hmm. To say that our explanation of these verses is reasonable. Yeah. It's logical, it makes sense. Not only is it in agreement with history, it's actually in agreement 
with the way the verses are structured internally the way they're put together it's all in agreement with that and it can all be taken from 4610 this is not the only place there are other verses that have this same internal structure uh, but this is probably the most important one for us to understand and the reason why it's important to see this is because you've got this then here this happens then this happens so there's a sequential history here or a cause and effect so after this struggle then this struggle is going to happen and you can see it's a mirroring so after he gets punished by this power this power will get punished by this one and as soon as you've developed that argument and you know that the time of the end is 1798 how do we know that how do we know the time of the end is 1798 without proving it where, where do where do we go where would we go to find that information history history but the word time of the end isn't a historical thing so that wouldn't help us what is I don't know. It just it says three words, four words. Time of the end. I don't know what it means. It's a biblical term. With it, does it mean the end of time? It means the end of something. I don't know. Um, it's the start of. So, I would say simply, uh, we can go to the spirit of prophecy, and Alan White will tell you directly. At the time of the end is 1798. He'll give you that information. You don't even have to work for it. Cool. Straightforward as that. So I'm just going to say how you know you have to go to the Spirit of Prophecy. She'll teach you this. But we've got a problem because we want to find 1989. Now we're working through this backwards, obviously, but we should be working through this in a forward fashion. And so we have to develop an argument. So it says, at the time of the end, this is going to happen, I could say then, or and, this is going to happen. Two things are going to happen at the time of the end. Yep. So it says, at the time of the end, this is going to happen, then, what? At the time of the end, this is going to happen. And we begin to develop an argument or a logic, at least a logic, to defend that there's two time of the ends. Before we even go into the history and start defending all of this, because the problem that you're going to be faced with in a minute is how did you get the king of the south, remember here the king of the south? How did you get that turning into Russia? When it was France here. From France to Russia, how did you make that jump? So we've got to be able to defend that, how we're going to make that jump. But before we make that defence, we need to make sure that our explanation of the verse itself, before we make an application, is correct. So you can see in all of this, I've not even made any application of who the people are to defend that I'm teaching the truth. All I'm saying is the structure of the verse is laid out very carefully and precisely by God, that it all works. And then we have to just go into Google Wikipedia, just go into the history and you can just populate all of that information and you can say this is France, the papacy, it's going to resurrect and it's going to attack Russia with the help of the United States. You can do all of that but you have to make sure that the verse itself is structured correctly. And the reason why that's important is because now you know, we're heading into verses that we've never headed into before and you're not sitting here listening to the words or the works of men that did these studies 15, 20 years ago and they've been firmly established. Now we're looking at verses that are open for discussion and you're part of that development process. So you don't have the opportunity or the luxury of saying, I wonder what the answer to that is. Because I'm saying, I'm not 100% sure. And you're going to say, well, if you're not 100% sure, how can you be 100% sure? I'm saying, well, we need to work together. Yeah? So, these verses here, you need to be sure for yourself that we didn't make any mistakes in these verses. Because if we made a mistake in some of these verses, we're not on a solid platform. 
and there are thousands, literally thousands of Adventists who will show you that we're structured these verses incorrectly. Mm. That our very foundation, our foundational verse, verse 40, is wrong. And in a nice little study like this, a study group that you've read the booklet and it all seems reasonable, you can gain a full sense of security because we're in this little enclave where we're protected and shielded by the onslaughts of Adventism where nobody's coming in here and attacking us. And all you need to do is some strong person who moves to the area who doesn't agree with you, who has studied this, who has written a really good on their Bible, they need to come to your group and they'll cause you a lot of problems because they're going to ask you to defend what you're teaching. And if I was one of them, the first thing I'd want to know is how do you change the hymns so simply? Because you're breaking rules, apparently. And we know that one rule cannot fight against another rule. They all have to be integrated. So if we don't apply the rules judiciously and carefully, we can get into problems. And this verse is so important because you've got to create, you've got to sort out to two hymns, and you've got to create two time of the ends. And Ellen White doesn't give you a lot of help to do that. She'll give you this one here, and that's about all the help that she'll give you. And it gets more problematic because she's going to tell you that the time of the end is a point and a period. And that causes even more confusion for us because people say, for sure, at the time of the end this happened, but in the time of the end, then the king of the north attacked the king of the south in the time of the end. Any time in that, any time in that, and we have to defend against that because we can't say in, because the Bible doesn't teach that, it says, at the time of the end. We have to try and be precise with our words. So I'm saying this, in summary, as we close. We're going to, we're going to carry on doing this study, but I just wanted to show us, uh, so we come together, that this thing is an important thing to understand. It's not, it's not the be all, be all and end all of everything. This is just one example of, of some of the rules that we need to become familiar with. But I want us to see that what seemed relatively unimportant here actually becomes a real issue here. And if you can see this structure, it doesn't happen all the time. Um, sometimes they don't just fall on your lap this simply. Um, here, you can see how needful it is to know this rule. So, we've used exactly the same rules. We've got A's, a, a, M, a and B, A and B, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. And then we just populate it and it all fits. It's all structured really nicely. So once we've structured it, then we know it's not three entities. It's not France, Egypt and Turkey. It's only two. And you'll notice in verse 36, it says, and, second word, uh, the. There is a definite article. It says, and the king. And Uriah Smith is going to go to a famous um, theologian who's an expert in Greek and Hebrew. And he's going to change that word the to an a. And he's going to say, if you could change the word the to an a, because he understands about grammar really good. So if you can change it to a, now it opens a license to make this king someone else. And who is the someone else? France. He's going to change it to France. And once you change verse 36 to France, and you're saying it has to be the papacy, you follow through, because by the time you get to verse 40, the hymn has to be France. So you can see how you start off with the wrong premise, and uh, it can land you into really difficult places. So we've structured the verse, we know it's the king, papacy, comes down, and it says him. But we're not even going to use that structure, we're going to say in the verse itself, using this chiasm, that King of the South hymn, King of the North hymn, there's a hard break in here. This is a neat way, I think it's a neat way, of identifying that the hymn is the King of the North, the B's match up, and the King of the South is the hymn, the A's match up. And there's only two parties involved here. 
and I think you need to see this clearly because then it gives you the license to say at the time of the end this happened then or and at the time of the end this happened because you need to construct two time of the ends and it's very important for us to see that because this alpha and omega happens over and over again and what we're going to say is this history here was like this there was an alpha and in this history there was also an alpha <coughs> which is the time of the end which is the time of the end and this time of the end is going to take us to an omega take us to an omega and then we can get this history and bring it underneath this history because what is this history what happens in 1798 which people are, is it talking about like the church I mean the Millerites so this is Miller and I'll just say this is us this is 89 and this is 1798 that's why it's so important not to change the at into an in because if it was in it could mean any time sometime after this attack happened the papacy is going to do its own thing it's going to rise up sometime do we all know that the papacy is going to rise up after it gets resurrected because the deadly yeah. is healed the deadly wound is healed was that wound a deadly wound or just a, a wound? Just a wound? Deadly. What does deadly mean? Yeah. Fatal. It means dead. Yeah. Was he really dead? No. Oh, you just said you said it was fatal, and then you said it's not. No, no. Oh, so was it? Was he really dead? I'm going to say he was. The Bible says he was really dead. Yeah. It was a deadly wound. It offered to, It killed him. So, when Napoleon goes to the Pope and divorces him, the Pope dies. Not literally. The wound that it received was a deadly wound. It died. And if you die, and your name was the papacy, and you're going to come back as a papacy, what must you do? What do we call that? Resurrected. The resurrection. So now he has to be resurrected. And that's what's going to happen in the papacy. It's going to resurrect. And Adventists teach that you get straight out of the great controversy. But the great controversy doesn't tell you when. That's what this message is about. One of the key components to our message is that you want to know when the papacy begins to resurrect. Because you want to know when it gets killed. When it receives the deadly wound and when it begins to resurrect. And you can't get that information if you get verse 40 wrong. That's why you have to be able to defend and explain and to prove to anybody's satisfaction. And we can do it with the history because this book deals with the history really well. And it, there's some other logics to that. You have to be able to show that the king of the south and him are the king of the north and him. And that the him here is indeed the king of the north and the him here is the king of the south and that Uriah Smith was not correct when he did that work that's the first thing you need to prove and then you need to prove that it's not in the time of the end at any time it's at the time of the end the king of the south attacks the king of the north at the time of the end and then the king of the north and the king of the south so the king of the north attacks the king of the south at the time of the end there are two time of the end or we'd say, we wouldn't call it two times of the ends, even though sometimes we say that we say, at the time of the end, this happens, and at the time of the end, this happens. And we have to look for his, an historical event when this happens. And now we have to go to Google or Wikipedia to find when did the King of the North, who's a papacy, attack the King of the South. But before we can do that, we need to have a logic to change from France to Russia. So there's a lot of information to be able to put together when we're dealing with this one verse.
but these rondos are so important for us to get right. Mm -hmm. And all I've tried to show you is now is not all the intricacies of how you do that and all the different pieces of logic. It's to show us the importance of Bible study. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to encourage us that when we look at the Bible is to just sit and meditate upon these words. Go on the computer if you have one and do word searches uh, or the meaning of the words, in, even in secular dictionaries. Go and check what these words meant in the original. See how Ellen White uses them. There are many, many techniques to, to understand what the verses teach. And also look for patterns and structures in the verse itself. So come to an understanding of what the verse teaches before you move on. And you'll see that the Bible becomes interesting. And not only interesting, it becomes manageable. And what I mean by manageable, it, I mean that you can begin to say, not that you can do it in your own strength, I'm not trying to infer that, but you can do it without the help of human aid. And I'm not saying we should can come together, but when we come together, we come together as brethren. I know that we sometimes have someone who leads out, and we may have a clear understanding of some, th some things, but we need to be careful that we don't have this subservient um, relationship where people begin to lord it over other people and say, you need to have truth only from me. And the reason for that is because there are problematic verses that people haven't straightened out yet. And if you get someone who's very forceful and say, this is the truth, you need to be able to know how they develop that truth from those verses so that you know that you're not being misled. So we need to try and become as confident as we can in studying the Bible for ourselves to make sure that what people are teaching is true. And I know it all sounds simple when I say that, and you'll say yes, and I'll go and teach you a verse now and say it means this, and I'll do it really quickly in, in this kind of like a clever, sophisticated way, and it all looks good, and I haven't really given you the opportunity to prove it. So it almost looks like, you know, like a card trick. <laughs> uh, and I say, did you see how that happened? He said, no, but it looked good. Yeah? So you need to go back and think about these things and study them really carefully. And it takes time and energy and effort. But I want to show us at least some rules and some encouragement. Because I'm not saying you've got these three rules you need to run away and you're going to work it all out. It's not that simple. But just to encourage you that you could now look at Daniel 11 verse 40, which you've all looked at before, in a new and I think interesting and fascinating way maybe you haven't seen before but you can see it works and you can see it's right based upon all your pre-knowledge because we saw it done there simply and if you can see it done there you can see that makes sense it works so I'm hoping now we could all go in even in our own different ways to defend verse 40 to see at the time of the end at the time of the end that the hymn is the king of the north and the hymn is the king of the south and you can't just say a hymn is a hymn all the time. It doesn't work that way. And what we haven't done is we didn't show how Russia, uh, how France turns into Russia. But you know, we, that, that's not relatively difficult to do. And we didn't prove why it's 1989. But again, that's not difficult. We all, we, the book teaches you how to do that, the booklet. But I wanted to show us this, so that if you can become confident on this, you can go to other portions of scripture. And this is what the Lord wants us to do. This message is designed for us to come into a closer relationship with Christ. Because by beholding, we become changed. You know, when you marry someone, and you look at this person, the one that you're about to marry, and you fall deeply in love with them, and your whole thought processes are just... Um, taken over by this person, that's all you can think about. This is what Bible study should be about. It should be an enjoyable, pleasurable experience yeah. where we're fascinated in getting to know the Lord. And what I want to say is, this is as much about getting to know the Lord as John 3.16, for instance. Because the Lord is teaching us who he is and how he operates and how he works. And when we begin to understand these verses in a clearer way, we become engaged in them. And this is how we become transformed. To have the mind of Christ means this transformation process 
And if we want to be Christ-like, or like Christ, we need to understand how he thinks and how he operates. In a certain circumstance, on Monday morning when you're at work and this difficult situation comes, how are you supposed to behave in that moment? Because there's not a Bible verse that's going to teach you that. You need to know what Christ would do in that circumstance. How do you know what Christ would do in that circumstance? You have to know who Christ is. And the way you get to know Christ is through deep Bible study. Deep sounds like a cliche phrase. But I mean, you need to know your Bibles well. And you need to study for yourselves. And most of us don't study for ourselves because it's not interesting. Because nobody's ever taught us how to study the Bible for ourselves. And it's good. It is very good to do a Bible on the, sab on the subject of the Sabbath <coughs> and have ten verses. And you have like a little cheat sheet in your Bible. And you, you, know, and you say, you lead this summer to a Bible study in the Sabbath. You go to this one and this one. And that's really good. I'm not saying that's not, but we need to study the Bible also in different ways and meditate upon these verses yeah. and not just meditate upon the Lord is my shepherd and think, Lord, you know, I'm a sheep and you're a shepherd. That's good, but in a structured prophetic way. So we've done this and we've done this and tomorrow we're going to do a little bit on Noah. So I want to show you a few things on Noah with respect to this 120. I want to make a little connection here. And then we'll just press ahead with our study. Please ask questions. And if you had questions before I came that you weren't sure about, or if you've got questions as we're going through, I don't mind doing a little detour, a little diversion to answer your questions. I want to answer your questions. Yeah? So please don't feel afraid. Don't get intimidated when I ask you questions. We're all here to, together. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, that you've brought us here all safely together on this Holy Sabbath day, that we can honour you through meditation and prayer and study. Father, the worship that we've just offered you, may you find it pleasing and acceptable. May the thoughts and ideas that have been generated in our minds be such as would be pleasing to you, and not only pleasing to you, Father, but also pleasing to us. We know that it was your design from the beginning to make your word charming and beautiful and seductive and to draw us in. But Satan has lied to us. He's put a cloak of darkness over your word and made it obscure and difficult. And we've bought into those lies. Not only in our own personal walk, Lord, but our fathers and our forefathers for generations and generations back have aided and abetted in that work of making what was pure and clear obscure and difficult and dark. As you begin to shed light on your word, each of us begs you, Father, that we might be receiving the Holy Spirit and that we might have our hearts and our minds illuminated to the truths that you want to teach your people, that you've wanted to teach us from the very beginning. Lord, we thank you that we're living in this time of in Earth's history, that we're seeing things that the prophets of old spoke about all being fulfilled before our very eyes. We stand amazed at your goodness and mercy. But why should we? Because you've said already that you will declare the end from all of those things that happened at the beginning. May we have confidence in this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.